MIT Communications Forum and a professor of literature at MIT. I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all to today's forum. Let me begin by uh, announcing very briefly two of our two final events for this spring term. Uh, we've set, I think, a very high standard this term, and I'm very proud of the forums we've managed to put together. On Thursday, March 21st, our forum will focus on massive online courses and their implications. One of our speakers is Anant Agarwal, who's the president of the edX program centered at MIT and Harvard. A second speaker is the co-founder of Coursera, Professor Daphne Kohler of Stanford. And um, um, she'll be, those, those two uh, panelists will be joined by a professor of English who, who has recently been appointed the president of Lafayette College, and she has a peculiarly humanistic view, even a skeptical view of the power of these massive online courses. What I'm expecting is a wonderfully rigorous discussion of a central educational question. And then on Thursday, April 11th, we will have, a, I, I hope, a very powerful and interesting debate about the moral quality of, of our press campaigns, and our title is something like News or Entertainment, the Press in Modern Political Campaigns, and one of our speakers is our MIT colleague, Tanahisi Coates, who writes for The Atlantic, and I'm looking forward to that event as well. Now, it remains for me now, as briefly as I can, to introduce our event for tonight. I, but let me begin by saying that uh, Nate Silver's appearance in this conversation uh, uh, has him join what I think of as an especially distinguished subset of visitors to the MIT Communication Forum. And they include such figures as Stephen Greenblatt uh, of Harvard and his Harvard colleague uh, Stephen Pinker, the poet laureate Robert Pinsky. So Nate is in very distinguished company, although he knows a lot more about a good many things that many of us are interested in than any of those three speakers. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to uh, 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 call attention to that subset of forum activities because we're particularly proud of them. And I want to also add that tonight's moderator, um, uh, 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 has has uh, also uh, also joins uh, a distinguished group of moderators who include among others my wonderful past colleague Henry Jenkins uh, and the legendary MIT linguist and uh, um, uh, empresario uh, um, uh, uh, S J Kaiser. Jay Kaiser. So, so I, I'm very happy that Seth is joining this distinguished group, and my hope is that Seth will continue to play a significant role in future forums. But our featured speaker tonight, Nate Silver, surely because of the size of our audience, doesn't really need an introduction. It occurred to me as I was thinking about his career that it's an interesting cautionary tale for MIT students. Uh, there's something profoundly entrepreneurial and deeply intelligent about the way uh, Nate Silver has made his career, and I'm sure many of you know about his progress from, uh, uh, a batch, from moving from a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Chicago uh, to uh, working as a blogger and a, and a pollster to creating his own blog, the 538 blog, then to have been, in a sense, hired by the New York Times to become the, uh, to, so, to, which have proprietary control of that remarkable blog that had such a powerful influence on our on, 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 the, on the recent election and, and, and uh, predicted it so accurately. Well, that remarkable career for, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a kind of model in a way that I know that M M many MIT students think about, uh, a young person who uses the qualities and, and skills that he learns in university to sort of be a kind of entrepreneur. And I think uh, one of the things that occurred to me is that many MIT students might consider, given the nature of uh, Nate's career, uh, uh, to have taken their statistics courses and their economics courses and then to have spent the rest of their time at Fenway Park. <laughs> but, but, but that may not be the, the most appropriate lesson to have, to have learned. In any case, we're very happy to have uh, Nate Silver with us. And uh, I uh, uh, turn the uh, podium over, over to our two speakers. Um, first, thank you all uh, for coming, and I hope we will keep it lively enough so that the folks standing on either side don't get too frustrated. Um, the uh, hashtag for the event is MIT Nate Silver. Um, I'll be monitoring uh, that and 
we might get some questions um, from the Twitterverse as we go on. Uh, some comments so far are nerds nerding out, standing room only. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, but I think the format is going to be neat, and I are going to talk for about 45 minutes to an hour, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, his new book is on sale outside, uh, which means that the people who are in the overflow will get first dibs at buying that. Um, and he'll stick around for a little while afterwards to, um, to sign books. So um, I wanted to start just going back to the beginning of your career uh, after you graduated from school. Um, you're obviously best known for your political work and your baseball work. That isn't what you started out doing. No, I, uh, and I should say it's a real honor to be here. We are kind of at ground zero for, for nerds, I think, here <laughs> in Cambridge. Uh, but it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, but no, I started out in, uh, in 2000, and, and the economy was good back then. Kind of last year, the economy was good for, for a while. And I took a uh, consulting job at KPMG where uh, it was billed as something where I'd do some, uh, some public sector consulting and some private sector stuff. But I wound up spending most of my time doing something called transfer pricing consulting, which, uh, which concerns tax regulations that govern how much income a multinational company can get out of its subsidiaries. You're like, well, right. is Singapore, uh, is Motorola's factory in Singapore, this is, it's really boring, right? So it's supposed to sound boring. Uh, <laughs> are they paying enough to the US government for the cell phone parts that are made in Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that was, um, that was pretty dreadful. Uh, I think too many kids probably do take a job as a, as a consultant, but I haven't really thought very much about, about what I wanted to do. Just by going to UFC, the place where fun goes to die, I tried to have, <laughs> tried to have fun in college, and, uh, and my degree was in That's economics. That's not MIT, explored, apparently. Not MIT, <laughs> yeah. Um, I took a year in, in London, so I don't know. It's, I think it's tough for, uh, for someone who's, who's 21 or 22 to necessarily know exactly what course they want to take in life, and I'm suspicious, by the way, if there are 21-year-olds who know exactly what they're going to do. So it took me a few years to to realize that um, that I was been made pretty miserable by a job that wasn't very very challenging, and started kind of rebelling against it in in different ways. Some of which meant having more fun with my friends in Chicago, but also uh, I mean I started to play poker more often and uh, and develop this forecasting system, which eventually became um, Picota for baseball players, which I sold to Baseball Prospectus. And so you, well, first, uh, why don't you just briefly explain what Pakoda is and why it was seen as so revolutionary at the time. So the, the notion behind, well, there are a couple of, of things that made Pakoda different. Um, one of which is that when you had seen projections for baseball players, it would say, well, uh, Dustin Pedroia is going to hit 303 next year with nine home runs and 42 doubles. Only nine. Huh? Yeah. Well, I don't know, right? But some exact, <laughs> some exact sequence of numbers, and it felt to me like what you should really have is a is a range of outcomes. Um, where anyone who's watched baseball knows that yeah, it's predictable to a certain degree. Um, but especially for for a younger player, you could have a guy who goes on to be the next a young third baseman, be the next Mike Schmidt or the next Kevin Ory kind of Cubs disaster, basically, um, even though they have the same profile, the same statistics up to a certain age. So to capture the range of forecasts was one of the innovations. The other one was to do it all by means of, of comparable players. So in baseball, you have, it's the world's best data set, basically. You have a very, very rich uh, database for every player you can find dozens of players in the past who were similar to him. And so that's the way we mapped out different possibilities for, for his career trajectory. Um, and so it was kind of, you know, it also made it more, more fun and more tangible. It kind of shows you the work a little bit more. Um, and that's one thing I try and do in, in, uh, in the forecasting products I put out, those themes that remain true, where number one, things are, are framed in terms of probabilities and not certainties. And number two is you do show some of the intermediate steps. And we do get criticism. We're definitely not, 538's not at an academic level of, of disclosure. Um, but it does show people the work a little bit as far as how do you get there. And I think that has more value than, uh, than a, than a uh, kind of black box approach. The journey is often more interesting than, uh, than the result, I think. And so you developed Picota, you sold it um, to Baseball Prospectus, which is uh, probably the premier sabermetric site 
um, online. Um, sabermetrics, for people who aren't familiar with the term, uh, just really refers to using statistics in a fairly sophisticated way to analyze baseball. Um, uh, and then you moved over to baseball prospectus yourself. So did your parents or your friends or um, anyone think that you were insane for leaving what I assume was a good paying consulting job? Well, uh, see, most of my income came from, from playing poker at right. that time. Uh, <laughs> So there was, in 2003, a guy named uh, Chris Moneymaker won the World Series of Poker, and he actually was a, an, an accountant um, with a job not totally unlike the one I had, right? Um, but he basically is, a, is an okay poker player who got, who got really lucky, right? Of course, when you have this turned into a television broadcast and every decision he's making is made to look as though it's genius and perceptive and... Um, and the bad calls he makes, you know, are shown. Whereas, uh, or excuse me, the ones that turn out to be right, right? We make a decision that where you're wrong, but if you made the right decision to be shown on TV, we get edited out. If you made a dumb choice instead, <laughs> anything about poker on on TV is you you actually see because of the whole cam what cards someone has, and so uh, so you know poker is really easy to play if you know what hand the other person has, right? <laughs> uh, so people will watch this on ESPN and, and get the sense, like, oh, I can tell that guy is bluffing. Well, yes, yeah, because you know he has seven deuce offsuit because the, the, you know, it's showing him. Right. Uh, so a lot of people thought they were, they were better at poker than they were, and so particularly online, it was possible to make, uh, make pretty good money uh, playing poker for, for a couple of years. And so, uh, <laughs> so that enabled me to, uh, uh, to leave my job. And it was like I would stay up all night and, uh, you know, make 500 bucks or something playing online poker at 7 in the morning and catch a cab to work and kind of sleep in, at my desk, right? And it's like, I don't care anymore, right? You kind of were <laughs> hacking the system a little bit. Um, I wish I'd play more poker, actually, because now the games have gotten very tough and you can't really play online. But those things went together where um, it was uh, less of a financial leap than it might seem because I had two different ways to, to make income. And, and so you can't play poker online anymore now because um, the sort of naive players who were over-assuming their skills have been weeded out? Well, there, there are two things. Number one is the U.S. government passed a law in 2006, right. uh, I think it was, right. um, that um, whether it technically banned online poker or not is debatable, but it made it very hard to get money into the sites. And so what happened is that once you had the bad players, the fish we call them, bust out, there was no more ready supply of them. So you kind of had um, uh, the whole ecology, the whole kind of ecosystem <laughs> collapsed, basically, where right. the, the predators became uh, you take out a keystone species. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, although now I should say, uh, you know, Nevada and New Jersey, um, this law did permit states, and as well as subsequent interpretation by um, Department of Justice, did do permit states to run their own online gambling sites. So um, uh, online poker in Nevada and New Jersey is going up later this year. Um, other states, I'm sure, um, will follow. I'm not opposed to, uh, to gambling, but you have seen in general a context where gambling is legal in one jurisdiction, then it becomes legal in neighboring jurisdictions because you know, uh, you're otherwise just giving up money, basically. Right. Um, so, so you probably will see um, a revival of online poker and the plays become a lot more sophisticated. But if you have a lot of new and naive players, then um, you know, hey, look, if you're if you're here at MIT, you probably have a lot of good gainful ways to make <laughs> uh, to you know to employ yourself. But but do but watch out, another, right? right? If there is another poker boom in in 2014 or 2015, then it might not be a, a bad hobby on the side. Right. <laughs> um, uh, so you um, brought Pakoda to Baseball Prospectus. Um, and then actually went and joined the site and were there from when to when, roughly? So from roughly 2000, end of 2003 to 2008 or so. Um, and you were, when you were at Baseball Prospectus, were you primarily writing or doing, developing more analytical tools? So it was a combination. So, <clears throat> um, so I was also helping to, to manage the business. And so I was doing like, like three or four things at once, which is, I guess, something that, uh, that I've gotten used to doing. Um, but it is tricky. It was a small business, and in some ways, it was ahead of the curve. As we had, we had a, a paywall um, very early on, and, and was basically successful, where it was self-sustaining, and you allowed, um, you know, a half dozen people to have a, an income from it. Um, but also, I mean, the competition got a lot better, I think, in in a hurry in baseball. The competition um, in analyzing baseball or, or the, um, uh, the competition from the sense of the people who are putting teams together, the actual well, player Well, actually, one, one problem that baseball prospectus had is that uh, it became 
It wound up being a, a kind of feeder system for, for, for major league teams, where I think it must have had uh, a dozen people graduate uh, to go work for, for front offices somewhere, um, and, uh, and that became a real, <laughs> a real problem. Um, and you see that now where, uh, you know, John Hollinger, who was ESPN's kind of the guru of basketball stats and ESPN's, um, you know, best kind of quant basketball writer got hired by the Memphis Grizzlies, I think it was, uh, not long ago. So, so that kind of it's, uh, becomes surprising now, where now you can kind of make a better living, I guess, on the inside and the outside, where sabermetrics always began as kind of an outside agitation against, like, all oh, these stupid decisions supposedly that, that teams were making, and now you see... Um, it's been co-opted. Well, and, and 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 Bill James is working for the Red Sox. And Bill Sox. James working for is working for the Red Sox. Although um, seemingly from the last couple of years, might not have that much influence at the moment. Um, well, I you know I do think it's uh, so I, I guess I'm one of those rare people where I don't find uh, you know I wouldn't say never, but I wouldn't find it all that attractive necessarily to work for a team in part because I like to be able to um, to analyze. Data where where your only incentive is you're, you're kind of your own boss, right? And you're able to share your conclusions with with the broader public. I think that's more um, that's more interesting than taking a conclusion. Where this is the same thing I've done consulting projects from time to time, right? Where you find some really interesting data and you share it with a room full of of twelve people or something, right? It's much less satisfying uh, psychologically than kind of being able to disclose it to the general to the general public, right? Um, right. So. Um, as you were working at Baseball Prospectus and as you were doing all of this, uh, you developed what turned into 538 at, at the same time, right? So how did that start? Um, so it began, I mean, you know, I think in a lot of things in life there are always a few threads that kind of are pulling together in different ways. So um, in part because of this law that Congress had passed in, uh, in 2006 to ban online poker. I'd followed the ins and outs of that a lot. And then what happened to, um, excuse me, to the representatives and senators who took the lead in passing the bill. Unfortunately, a lot of them, a lot of them lost or retired. Um, but so that got me more engaged in politics. And then I was living in, in Chicago at the time. I had gone to the University of Chicago. And so, um, so Barack Obama was a name that, um, that always, like, the campus progressives were always like, oh, Barack Obama, he'll be president someday, right? I'm like, give me a break. Who cares? Uh, <laughs> but it was a name. It wasn't in that was familiar to me, so it was kind of exciting uh, to have a candidate who, uh, who I, you know, I felt like was in the same circle at U of C, um, was running for president. And then just that campaign was so darn interesting between between Hillary um, and Barack and and you know Sarah Palin and, and everyone else. It was uh, it was a great news story. Um, but also, I found that having seen um, you know by that point, I think in 2007 and 2008, you had seen a lot of the money ball clash kind of play out in favor of, of this kind of emerging consensus where you can use both types of information. You're, you have the same goals, ultimately, especially with regard to, to Both types players. of information meaning um, sort so of you, the, uh, yeah. eyes on the ground, intelligence. The kind of, the sub, this, you know, and this gets complicated where I, you know, I get finicky in my book about how to use the term subjective and objective, but right. basically stats versus kind of subjective scouting views of players. And we can break that distinction down more later on. It is a bit problematic. But basically, the, the, the stat geeks and the Stats scouts. Stats versus makeup. Yeah. We're, we're getting along better and better. Right. Um, but it seemed like, like politics coverage was still very stuck in, in the Stone Ages by, um, by comparison um, and not very data-driven at all. And so, um, and so having seen um, this development in baseball, it seemed like it was kind of overdue for for some of the same approach. So it's interesting because in baseball, it seems like one of the things that, that drew you to that was the fact that the people who were actually putting together the teams were not using this analysis, and that created an opportunity. Yeah. And in politics, um, if, I, if I heard you right, it wasn't that the campaigns were not doing this, but specifically that the press corps was yeah, not Yeah, so this. it really was more. Um, so the, the revolution. Uh, so to speak, in baseball happened from uh, very much from the outside in, where you know Bill James was doing this stuff uh, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, but you always have had campaigns that were reasonably sophisticated about this stuff, um, including um, the the Bush Rove campaigns in 2000 and 2004. For some reason, um, in 2008 and 2012, 
both John McCain and Mitt Romney did not seem to learn that lesson, um, that you want to invest in your voting targeting efforts. But, but Obama did um, and kind of inherited that mantle in, in 2008 and 2012. Um, you also had things like the Howard Dean campaign in 2004 that were, that were a part of this story. Um, and, and, so, and when you say this, okay, we're sophisticated about this stuff, you, you, do you mean um, using whatever data points are available to craft a, a, a path forward? Well, particularly the, uh, you know, look, I think it's always dangerous when, uh, when campaigns are, are too worried about um, Here's what the polls, I think there's not often a lot of context about why people believe what they do. So I'm not one who says that, oh, campaign should be dictated by, by what the pollster tells you. Um, but this particular activity of, of micro-targeting, um, where you can say, here, so the way the Obama campaign does it, to simplify slightly, is you have every voter in the country, supposedly, um, is measured by two scores, one of which measures on a scale of zero to 100, where zero means you're a sure, Romney voter, 100 means you're a sure Obama voter, and then the other dimension is how likely you are to vote, period. Um, so you might have someone who, who if they're going to vote, they're almost for sure going to vote for Obama, but they might not vote. And they're going to get a different type of, of literature than someone who, um, who is definitely going to vote, but they're a swing voter there, or someone who you might be able to peel off from the Romney campaign. Um, so coming to those profiles based on collecting all types of, of information about someone's name. By the way, I mean, you can tell an awful lot about someone just based on, on their name and, and where they live, right? If you have a name and address, then you know an awful lot about what their income is, their ethnicity, their age, actually, because different first names go into style at different periods of time. So just making those inferences alone, you can do reasonably good voter targeting. Of course, there are problems like, for example, I had a friend who was um, from, uh, from the Philippines. His last name was Rodriguez. And so you have a lot of heroes get like, uh, you know, literature targeted toward Mexican Americans there because right. you have a lot of Hispanic surnames in, in the Philippines. Um, right. But still, you can, get, you can get pretty far with that. Um, uh, and that helped, I think, both those campaigns a lot. It might not be a coincidence that, um, that in 2000, the team with the better voter targeting, um, which was Bush and Rove, uh, won the Electoral College despite losing the popular vote, whereas, uh, whereas in 2008, 2012, of course, Obama won both. But, um, but if you break things down, then Obama did a little bit better in the Electoral College in the swing states than you expect based on the popular vote nationally alone. So it seems to be worth an extra couple of, of points. And, and the Obama campaign um, in, in this last election actually went drilled down to the extent that they were doing studies as to what email subject lines were most likely to get people to open the emails. Yeah, believe me, I get every kind of spam from every campaign <laughs> ever, right? right? So it's like, hey, Nate, about that lunch date yesterday. It's like, oh, shit, did I you know, miss an appointment yesterday or something? And, uh, but you click on that email, and af after a while, you get, you get annoyed by it. And that um, literally is what the Obama campaign was doing. They found that very informal, like, hey, look at this, yeah. was much more effective than the future is at stake or something like that. See, what happens if there's like, some national security emergency and like, Obama actually has to get in touch with someone by, by email? Right. right? Yeah. It would be really... <laughs> hey, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, um, uh, so, so y you, you got interested in politics, or you got interested in working more in politics, and then how did 538 actually come about? Um, so I started writing at, uh, at, at Daily Coast, um, in part because it, I know. Um, under your name? Under, uh, anonymously under the pseudonym Poblano, which I don't, I always like Mexican food, and, um, <laughs> so it's kind of anonymous, and part of it was, uh, part of it was, I thought, well, here I'm known for, uh, for running about baseball, and you know, baseball and politics don't always intersect that well. Um, but partly also Wait, the idea. In what way don't always? Well, I think uh, you know, people have strong political views, and I think sometimes you don't want to think, oh, that, you know, that columnist is an asshole because he's a Republican or something, or a Democrat, um, instead of just writing about baseball for So you'd for want people to, to reflect on baseball perspectives around the work you were doing that was, there. That was part on, of it, right? right? Part of it was, uh, you know, I was kind of playing hooky from my job at Baseball Perspectives to do this stuff. And, uh, it seems like you have a history of that. I know. Well, every, <laughs> <laughs> every, I know. Every Future four employers years, beware. I, right. don't, I hope no one tweets that, but yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> But, you know, I, I, look, I do think... It's uh, too late. <laughs> I do think in the long run that you're so much more productive doing something which, uh, which captures your attention, right? That um, you really should do that 90% of the time. And, you know, there are always bad days where, although I've somehow avoided writing about the sequester. I mean, there are, there are very slow periods in the political campaign, and there are slow periods in, um, in the baseball calendar. And so, you know, 
you can't always just say, oh, I'm going to totally not write it, not, not do, do my job at all. Um, but in general, having a wider range of topics you can focus on, I think, is, is, um, is something that kind of your career, I think, embodies as well. But that's super, super duper helpful. Um, yeah. You know, right. one problem that uh, a lot of political journalists have is that, look, um, you have the same amount of column space in a print paper every day, more or less. Um, but the news <laughs> doesn't flow that way at all. Where so you have these peaks of, of, of coverage where very important things are happening, and you have months and months where nothing important happens at all. Um, and so some days it should be like, you know, we're just going to leave this page blank, right? And, you know, <laughs> nothing important happened in Washington today. Go see a movie, right? Um, but you can't, that's not the convention of, of political journalism. I think that's what much. Newsweek decided, actually. Yeah, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> Um, uh, so then, if you were worried about alienating your audience, what made you decide to go public? I think part of it is, uh, is you had people like from, from Newsweek, for example, in the New Republic who would want to, to talk to me, and it felt silly to say, you know, Poblano, a synonymous blogger with Daily Coast. Right. Um, <laughs> so at some point it became like, if I wanted to, um, to, to capitalize on this in any way, meaning let it grow, grow bigger and potentially shift careers, and I had to kind of, um, had to kind of out myself, I guess. Uh, and so by the time that you did that, you had some experience with coming into a field that was fairly set in its ways. And um, certainly uh, sports journalists are not the most forward thinking group of people in the country. Um, what was the reaction among political journalists to your arrival on the scene in 2008? I think at first it was, uh, it was actually friendlier at first than it became later on. When you were a right? sort of cute little diversion yeah, 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 and yeah, not right? someone um, who was threatening their jobs. Yeah, before you become someone who becomes threatening, right? Where, um, so you know, it did get a lot of attention in, um, in the kind of mainstream press, and that helped quite a bit. I mean, part of that is you know, I, the flip side of having uh, cases where there's no news, but you have to have a news story, is cases where there's so much demand for, for coverage. And, and 2008 was. Uh, one of these historical years, you'll maybe have you know one of the five great elections of the century. So you might have one fascinating election every 20 years or so, and so that's a huge story about the biggest possible uh, political story, except maybe a president getting impeached or something, right? Um, and so you didn't have enough <laughs> enough coverage relative to the demand for it, and so um, so different ways to look at it where it was a good time uh, to be in that space. Uh, and and so. Uh if I'm hearing you right, so political journalists weren't threatened in the same way. One of the reasons was because there was no fear of someone reading Nate Silver and not reading something else because That's people right. were, yeah. um, their appetites were endless at that point. That's right. And, you know, I, th I think partly, I, you know, um, it, I mean, I don't know, I was going to say the tone of the blog wasn't as combative, but it's probably not true. It was actually <laughs> probably more, more combative. It was more kind of bloggy and, and, and stuff. Um, but for some reason, so once you start writing for, for the New York Times to become more of a more of a target, definitely. Um, but also, yeah, once you once you realize, like you know, uh, we do actually have a different model. I guess I'd say so. Maybe the tone of the blog was actually more cheeky and more confrontational and less mature. I guess I'd say back in in 2008. Um, but I did realize as I went along that philosophically, I actually have have opposition to the way that campaigns are covered by by much of the mainstream press. So it's not just oh, here's a a different way, I think uh, it's like actually um, you guys are doing it doing it wrong. And this blog um, contains a strong implicit element of, of and sometimes explicit element of, of media criticism, for lack of a better term. So uh, I want to come come back to that. But um, so in 2008, you you famously got 49 out of the 50 states <laughs> right. Um, was it Indiana? Indiana, you, yeah. You missed. <laughs> yeah. Um, and all 35 Senate races. Right, um, and so uh, after that, was it clear to you that this was something that was going to be more than an election year sort of sideline? And was oh, I gonna... think so. Yeah, at some point, I mean, already by late in the 2008 campaign, it become my it become my full time job, and I'd stopped writing about baseball. I'd stopped playing poker a couple of years earlier. <laughs> so so that had become fairly clear. Although if if uh, if McCain had had won, we had him as a, with a two percent chance to do so, then it would not be. A very good career choice, I don't think, any longer. But um. uh, Well, and that's something I, I also want to come back to. But um, uh, so two years later, in 2010, um, you moved over to the New York Times. Uh, how did that 
conversation begin? Um, so actually, uh, there's a little bit of a Boston connection, but I went to, uh, I went to the MIT uh, uh, Sports Business Conference mm -hmm. um, in 2010, I guess it was, um, and ran into one of the New York Times editors on the train platform coming back to New York. Who was um, that? It was uh, it was uh, Gerald Marzotti who uh -huh. runs the who yeah. uh, ran the magazine right. at that time. And um, is that I think just yesterday was possibly put in charge of their digital mm -hmm. strategic planning. Yeah. Um, and look, I think there are a lot of really great people at the times, and so. But when I ran into him, I had also been talking to other uh, other news organizations about um, about bringing five thirty eight on board, and I really did find that. Um, so you know, if you take the Times operation as a digital operation, I think it's the best digital journalism operation in the world. Um, for some reason, because it also has this, this print operation, which you can talk about separately. It's not meant in a pejorative way, right? But people forget that this is a really successful experiment in, uh, in how to get people to read content online, um, for how content looks online. Um, you know, NewYorkTimes.com is, uh, is an amazing website. And I found that the people I talked to there were, were quite progressive about um, not their politics, Per se, but in terms of what they thought about where journalism was headed, and so um, so they compared very well. I took a long time, several months, to make that decision. Um, compared very well against some other news organizations that um, that were thought of as being more more modern and digitally focused, um, and so it wasn't an easy choice by any means. You had, I mean, there were some other very attractive offers, like but, um, from what other news organizations? I, I can't. Yeah, okay. that I have to be a little bit careful. Could about. try, uh, but different. You know, different parts of. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I can't say too much. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but was so at at that point had you pretty much made the decision that you were going to join some media organization and not exist on your own? I I think so. I think I kind of come to that um, decision. I think part of it is that uh, it's hard to have time to um, to both uh, be a content <clears throat> producer um, and kind of be a, a business person who's managing the brand, right? So the idea is that um, if you if you um, latch on with someone else, then then you have fewer business decisions to make once you make that decision. I should say you could maybe have done both, but it's also running a book at that time, and just so it was a way to say, look, first of all, the New York Times is a great way to distribute your your uh, your product. Um, but I think I felt like, um, yeah, in theory, there could have been a lot of upside to. Um, to building the business out myself, but um, but you know, look, I think a lot of mistakes or a mistake that a lot of businesses make, right, uh, is uh, you take someone who's a, a developer or a producer of content or ideas, and they become um, and they become a manager instead. And sometimes you're not utilizing that person uh, as well as you were originally, right? Um, where maybe they're even a, an above average to very good manager, but they were someone who was top of the charts as a as a inventor or a content. Producer, and so you're not really maximizing their, their skill set enough. Um, so, and did you find uh, when you joined the Times that your reach or influence immediately changed? Um, it was it was not like an order of magnitude shift. I think we probably got um, you know maybe uh, maybe fifty percent more traffic, which is still pretty significant. Right. Um, but it depends. With the Times, the uh, the slow days are actually. Uh, no better than they were at 538. Uh, but when you get on on the front page there, when something blows up, the peaks are a lot are a lot higher. Is the big difference. So what were at 538 right before you you, you moved over to nytimes.com? What kind of page views were you getting? Um, so during the election, I think on election day itself, we got like uh, 2008. I should say we got like three million unique visits. Um, but the standard uh, during a, a kind of Regular day leading up to the campaign was um, well. I guess I should say it was always on a steady ramp up throughout 2008. So it started out where um, where I had some following from Daily Coast. So I think the first day he had like 500 views, which isn't nothing. And then um, and then there was some profile in in Newsweek where it got up to about 3,000, and then uh, and then became 10,000. Then after Sarah Palin got got nominated, and you had the conventions and the interest really peaked up to 100,000, then up to, up to up to 3 million on. Um, on election day, and then you have the big fall. I mean, it would be nice to have three million page views every day, right? Uh, but that's not going to happen. Most people are are sane and have lives, and so once the election's <laughs> over, um, I'm not they, sure I agree with you there, but well, yeah, actually, <laughs> but most people have other interests apart from 
apart from politics, right. apart from campaigns. So, um, so it has. It's a blog that has very good and steady traffic, um, uh, uh, but not world-beating traffic during um, during the non-election part of the campaign. And then goes kind of off the charts during the election during the election cycle. Season. Yeah. So. Um, this election cycle, certainly your relationship to the mainstream media, despite having become a part of the mainstream media, um, seemed to be pretty radically different from what it had been in 2008. Um, a number of, of people seemed to be going out of their way to pick fights with you, or um, uh, you had uh, you and Joe Scarborough um, <laughs> got in a little dust up, uh, which I think you won fairly handily. But um, uh, but um, but also you know places like Politico, um, uh, as the campaign was unfolding, were writing pieces asking whether you were going to be a one-term celebrity. Um, uh, so my first question about that is. Why do you think that is? Was that just a case of people wanting to kick the big guy on the block down a notch? I think that's I think that's part of it. I had one um, uh, Politico reporter who shall remain nameless, but you know, tell me, I got hired by the time not Dylan Byers, uh, no, okay. hired by the Times. They're like, um, I was told by this reporter, like, oh, now that you're working for the Times, and we can't quote you anymore, right? So part of it is you have people who are um, who are deliberately... Oh, someone at Politico said, now that you're working for the Times, yeah, I can't yeah, yeah. So you. it's deliberate competition, right? right? It's not even... A lot of it is kind of... Some of it's premeditated. Um, but more... So we were talking about this earlier, right? Um, so in 2008, it was um, it was fairly clear for the most part that Obama was going was gonna to win, right? Um, to the point that, you know... Uh, even the press who was trying to report on polls, it's really, uh, there are some counterexamples where the McLaughlin group, um, three of the four panelists on, on election Wrong. in 2008, said, said, oh, it's a toss if it's too close to call. Right. Monica Crowley from Fox News said she thinks McCain would win by, by half a point, right? Um, but, uh, and but, she still has a job. Yeah, but in that election, it wasn't controversial to say uh, oh, Obama's going to win uh, kind of easily, right? Whereas this one was right on that precipice where, on the one hand, it wasn't truly really 50-50, and as much as it was misinterpreted, the blog, you know, we, we couch things in, in explicitly in probabilities. We were never saying, oh, Obama's going to win for sure. We were saying, but he is a favorite, and he's enough of a favorite that to describe it as a, as a toss-up is, is probably wrong, right? Um, and for some reason, the fact that the set of facts we were, we were working from were, uh, were so simple, right? Which just, you know, look, the polls by the campaign are pretty accurate if you take an average of the polls. You can do it our way, which adds a little bit of, of finesse in terms of how much we weight the polls. But any site, Real Clear Politics or, um, or you know, the Princeton Election Consortium or the five or six different ways to do it all had, we're calling, you know, 49 out of 50 states the same anyway, and all of them had Obama winning the Electoral College. You can debate about um, how much uncertainty there was around that. But, you know, I think that was part of what, uh, what made the attacks kind of personal at the end is that, you know, we were asserting a very simple set <laughs> Of you know, kind of sky is blue. Two plus two is four. Set of facts. Like, look, you know, can you add up to two seventy? That's how many votes you would need to win the electoral college. Can you take an average of the polls? Right. Well, if yes, you come to the conclusion that Obama's ahead right now. You can debate again. Does that does that mean he's ninety percent likely to win or fifty five percent? But but that's what I think made it so so personal. Is uh, is there wasn't this ambiguity? You couldn't just get lost in the weeds and debate the interpretation so much. Um, well, there also seemed to be um, this confusion among uh, among some of the people who were critiquing you about um, process and results, and, yeah. and having a, a, a process that um, essentially is a good process and is going to more often than not get you to where you want to be going, um, and always getting the results that you want or that are predicted from that process. And um, when you, uh, I guess you bet Joe Scarborough, is that right? He didn't accept the bet, actually. Okay. We both you offered wound up a, contributing a charity. Uh, right, which you, got in some, which you got in some trouble for there. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, uh, which uh, sort of showed old and new um, media Well, part of it perhaps. is that, uh, you know, um, you talk about people being, being too results-oriented and and they actually, they certainly are too results oriented. And I think I said before the election in different venues that like I'll get too much credit if I'm, if we have a good night on November 6th and too much blame if I don't. Um, and you know, I, we had a good night and I'm getting too much credit <laughs> right now. Um, but the point was in, in, uh, in a literal sense, you know, I had uh, in terms of kind of net future earnings discounted somehow that I had a lot more than, than 
you know, 2,000 bucks or whatever the bet was <laughs> right, on the right. line. And I don't think it's a bad incentive. Look, in, in, uh, in business, um, you know, you, you want your product to be successful. And there's some, some risk there. You can have a good process and, uh, and get a bad result or, or vice versa. Um, but the idea that you're tying your incentives to your notion of, of correctly forecasting an outcome, you know, why that's objectionable, I wasn't really... I wasn't really sure. When I played poker, it's honorable to bet, <laughs> to bet on things, right? Right. Um, so I kind of sympathized with the Mitt Romney, like, $10,000 bet, I guess, against Rick Perry in one of the debates, where it's like, at some point, this guy's yammering on, yammering on. It's like, okay, well, are you, you know, are you, are you, are you do you believe you're on bullshit? Well, then, bet on it, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but uh, it, it, let's say if you had not gotten all of the state, did you get 50 states right this time? Or, yeah. Um, so you called Florida. Right? <laughs> no, I, yeah, I did. No, I, <laughs> so I don't think, uh, I'm not sure that the 50 out of 50 thing matters so much as getting the, getting the election right. Like if we had had some, uh, some election where we had gotten, you know, so for example, we had Obama winning by, uh, by in the popular vote by 2%, on our election night forecast. He wound up winning by, by 4% instead, right? So it's almost as big an error, or the same error as if Romney had won the right. popular vote by, um, by one-tenth of a point or something. But I don't think it would have been seen symmetrically, certainly. If, uh, if Romney had yeah, won yeah, by yeah. one-tenth of a point. Yeah, I mean, you right. can criticize that, oh, Nate, you know, underestimate Obama. One thing that helped, I guess, was fortunate for me is that you had a lot of states that were, uh, were just barely leaning Obama. So if Obama beat his polls, they actually did, in most states, then um, then you're a little bit off, but um, but you don't call the winner wrong. Whereas if if Romney beat his polls by by a couple of points, he might have won uh, uh, four or five states. So you you know you'd be far from getting 50 right. But so it, it, apart from what the perception would have been in the public at large, um, let's say that you had gotten it wrong, those two percentage points, or, or uh, that had gone the other way. And it had gone the other way in enough swing states so that uh, Romney eked out an electoral college victory. Would you then have um, doubted the formula and doubted the system that you put together? Not, not too much, because you know uh, the funny thing about the 538 uh, formula is that there's more uncertainty, really. I mean, in a literal sense, when you're early in the election in June or July, there's more uncertainty because there's more time for, for different events to intervene. But there's also more structural uncertainty in, uh, in building the model where, for example, we had a way to account for the economy where we created an index of economic conditions. And then, but there are a lot of ways to do that or how you weigh incumbency. Um, so, um, so, you know, but by the time you get to the end of the campaign, you know, all the, all the model-based approaches really, really converge, right? Where it's because we weren't saying at that point it wasn't a complicated model at all. It wasn't trying to balance the economy and get the polls saying we're just looking at the polling at this point. Anything from the economy should be priced in by now. And it's just an exercise in saying um, how much uncertainty is there. And if you have a, a four point lead in a state or a three point lead in a state on election eve with robust polling, how often do you win that state? And that's a, a case where you come closer to there being like an objectively kind of right answer, whereas earlier, it's a more difficult modeling problem. And right. so, you know, I wouldn't have felt too bad if I, well, I would have felt bad for a lot of reasons, right? But, um, <laughs> but I don't think I would have said, oh, uh, for, I got to go back and When you say for a lot of reasons, you mean including the fact that you're an Obama supporter? No, I mean, for uh, mostly, I mean, believe me, if that, the, the fact that, uh, that Obama won the election was like, didn't occur to me until like two days after the fact. I'm like, oh, good, you know, I didn't fuck this up, right? Um, and now it'll be fun to troll Politico for, for a few days. Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, the fact that the, you know, I mean, and this is probably a bad sign in some ways, right? But, um, but I was working 100 hour weeks and you become so involved in this kind of psychodrama around what the 538 predictions mean, and also just the fact that you're making these, these forecasts and blogging and doing a book tour at the same time, right? So you become kind of abstracted from, uh, from the real world of the election. And even in 2008, we're actually, uh, was in the museum in Washington doing stuff for HDNet on election night, right? Where we were doing coverage until, uh, <clears throat> until one in the morning, right? And you kind of say, oh, Obama win. And then you, you get out and like people are like whooping and hollering around Washington DC, which is a very buttoned downtown ordinarily. And only then it actually dawned on me that, oh, you had Obama elected president, right? So you, I mean, being in the bubble is kind of a, a, a real thing, I think, um, and something that maybe, um, you know, of the other problems I have with campaign journalism, I think, you know, the lack of self-awareness of, of how your perceptions are skewed when, uh, when you're in that bubble as a reporter, um, when, uh, you know, 
75% of the American public has heard nothing about the sequester, right? Um, um, but, you know, journalists think that, oh, you know, the way Bob Woodward's column is interpreted will radically shift public opinion on this stuff. And, right. and that can be something you, you want to avoid. Right, right. Um, uh, so uh, there are a couple more points I want to get to before um, we, we open it up. One is just your, your future um, with the Times. I just want to read uh, what Jill Abramson, the editor, uh, executive editor of the Times, said recently. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so this was from after the election, I guess, uh, late November. She said, um, half the people coming to nytimes.com searched for Nate. They weren't coming for the rest of the times, they came for him. Um, she also uh, said that when, when asked if you would get a wing of the building, I think she said that <laughs> you have your own tower. Um, uh, so you're contract, you signed a three-year contract in 2010, um, which comes up this summer, is that right? Yeah. So what do you see for, for your future? So I don't have any, any news to break. I'm, <laughs> I'm in active discussions with, uh, with the Times, and, and, and like I said earlier, uh, it's a really great fit in a lot of ways. I think Jill's a terrific, terrific editor. You know, I mean, anything can happen in a, a negotiation, but, um, but, you know, we'll see. I'm, I'm pretty happy there, and, you know, and, and the, the best things and the worst things about working at the Times are, are, are for the most part, pretty self-evident, right? Where, <laughs> where the best thing is that, uh, is that you know, it's still uh, one of the most trusted brands and news. They make the content look really good and kind of they let their people have a fair amount, um, a fair amount of, of voice, right? So you look at someone like, uh, like David Carr, for instance, um, their media columnist. Um, you know, he has found a way to, uh, to have his own voice and somehow uh, have it be in harmony with the mission of the Times brand. I think there are other, there are other news organizations that tend to swallow up their voices, and, um, and that's problematic now. And so knowing, uh, knowing that is a, a definitely a reason to stay with the Times. The negative is just that you do get a level of, um, of scrutiny um, that I think is Deserve it in many cases, but also. Are you times. talking about scrutiny um, internally, or scrutiny because you're at the Times from the external world? Well, I think I think the Times, like any you know any newsroom, is is uh, often internally competitive as well as competitive with with its rivals. Uh, but I mean more in terms of you know uh, everyone comes after the Times, like it's the it's the it's the New York Yankees basically, right? And and a lot of people hate the Yankees, right? But everyone pays attention. <laughs> To what the Yankees do, potentially, right. um, you know, the the the, the less obvious uh, uh, downside of that is that sometimes it's hard to be kind of uh, kind of casual at the times, right? Where you know, with a blog, sometimes you can kind of say, well, um, here's an observation. You wouldn't quite phrase it exactly this way, but you'd say, here's an observation I have, but I haven't really thought about this very deeply, right? Um, I'm just kind of, you know. Farting around, I guess, right? Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's hard to do that There's at times. No it, it carries at such times. authority, right? <laughs> that when you say something that people don't, you know, like we got in some mini controversy with Politico the other day about, uh, about the choice of language I use to describe the activities of super PACs, right? It's like, well, we don't actually, it's not actually Is this important. the clarification versus correction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually not that important in the context for us to be super precise about the language. We're just trying to communicate this other point to the audience, right? Um, but at the times, you, you can get into more trouble for for that kind of thing, because people do uh, treat it as being so authoritative, which I'm not saying is a healthy thing necessarily. Um, but so it's harder to uh, to find that voice. But like I said, um, for people like myself, or like or like David Carr, or some of their tech columnists, or their sports columnists, they do um, it is a, a space that cultivates having having many voices and not just this one disembodied kind of voice of the, of the New York Times. So th that leads into another thing I, I wanted to get to, which is um, you mentioned how uh, your methodology is not as transparent as um, it, it might be in, for instance, an academic environment. Um, but you're fairly upfront about what you do. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about how this is actually not rocket science. You have a bunch of polls, and you can put them together. Um, so. What is it you think that has made you so uh, so popular? Is it the voice of the blog? Is it the fact that I know you work for your college paper, um, have spent a lot of time at writing? Is it the fact that you're not putting these numbers out there, which, as you said, Real Clear Politics does, a bunch of other yeah. sites do, but that you're doing it with voice and with narrative? Yeah, I mean, look, I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, on my on my writing. I just don't. 
I don't usually put a blog post up without reading it and rereading it four or five times. And, and the Times encourages you to, to think about your, uh, your prose. Um, I spend a lot of time on, uh, on the graphical presentations of things we do and the Times interactive journalists, the graphic journalists are, are uh, and this is not hyperbole, they really are like the best in the world at what they do. Um, and so that helps a lot. The way you're communicating information, I think, um, think a lot of these things we're talking about are, are not really that complicated, right? And I'm a guy who says, yeah, the details do matter. And sometimes I'll get in back and forth with academic political scientists about the nuances of um, how do you measure the economy in your election model, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but, but, you know, mainstream journalists are missing very, But that's very, more stuff very at the margins. Yeah, they, at the margin, right? right? They're missing very basic points. And I think uh, sometimes uh, when, um, I don't know, it's a balance. Because you can also have cases where, where conclusion is oversimplified. So that, I guess that's kind of the, um, the skill in good nonfiction prose writing about science or, or technology, right, is uh, how do you... Uh, distill the gist of something without dumbing it down, right? Um, and that does require some skill. And because I wrote about baseball and uh, because I had some background also as a kind of pseudo journalist in, in college, where I actually did go and. Uh, why why and, pseudo? Well, not pseudo, I guess, right? We actually go and track down like they're going to close down the softball field, talk to right. the, you know. So not, so, you know, not as much of it as some people might have, but it's I a did big have story a little bit of that. In Chicago. In, yeah, yeah, right? In high school and, and college. Um, so to have those skills was. Was really uh, was really helpful. Um, so I think two more questions. Uh, one is two more questions for me, and then we'll open it up to um, all of you. Um, one is, do you think that we could um, or are moving towards the type of predictions that you're that you do at five thirty eight, um, being able to apply? the methodology to make those predictions uh, about a broader subset of, of issues. Could that enter into a sort of scientific discipline um, the way that political forecasting has? Well, there, look, there's more interest in, uh, in, in data science now and kind of big, kind of big data. Um, I tend to be uh, suspicious of claims that suggest there's some massive inflection point in technological growth, I guess I'd say, right? So you clearly have... Me meaning what? Well, so you clearly have an exponential increase in the amount of, of data and information available to people measured in a variety of ways. Um, but that's never been the constraint, right? The constraint's not the amount of information you have, but our ability to come to useful knowledge uh, from that data leads, that yields you know, tangible improvements in technology and, and the economy and, and everything else, right? Um, and so you know, our human constraints are going to be a much bigger factor than, <laughs> than this growth of information, right? Um, and people also don't realize that sometimes uh, you, know, you might have a data set which is large, but not especially rich necessarily. Where, um, and this is part of what I talk about I mean, in the book, but you right. have problems like, like kind of overfitting as a technical name for a problem where, um, where you're, you're mining data from the past um, and claiming it's predictive, but really it's just uh, giving you a very detailed description of past happenings. Um, and it may not carry over and make good predictions as well. So my kind of, I mean, the book is a survey of uh, basically is big data producing con or progress in the context of prediction? The answer is um, is yes in some cases, but as a general proposition, it's slower than you might expect. And and so does that mean that um, you, you've you've gotten some criticism, uh, most notably I think in a New Yorker blog post about your reliance on Bayesian analysis? Um, uh, Am I, am I hearing you right in saying that we, there's a place for both types of analysis? Or? Well, I think, so, uh, you know, what qualifies as, as Bayesian is, is kind of a sticky subject, where if you talked about people who are formal statisticians, it means a specific set of, of methods, right? right. Um, and in my book, I don't usually mean it in, in that technical a way. Um, you know, and set is almost a series of, of values. Um, you know, one of the most important of which is that uh, you start from some base where you do have assumptions and biases that maybe are, are equal to the wealth of knowledge accumulated up to that point in time or what the consensus is at that point in time. Um, and so the, the alternative where you're testing a null hypothesis right is kind of, is kind of arbitrary. Um, and that if you find something which is statistically significant uh, relative to the test you set up. It doesn't make any sense in the broader context of, of other research. You should be sp suspicious of that, for example. And right, you see that right. in a lot of, of, um, of science journalism, for example, where sometimes 
you know, I think there are now something like three academic papers published every minute or some ridiculous statistic like that. Uh, tens of thousands every year. And sometimes the ones that make the most outrageous conclusions are the ones that get reported on oftentimes, and passed along oftentimes, think, yeah. right? And the peer review process is by not any means perfect, but you do gradually have this synthesis where someone says, no, this is, you know, the cure for everything. And someone says, no, it's a cure for, it's totally bullshit, right? And then, you know, eventually there's some synthesis where you move toward, toward the truth. You have that process. Um, and I see that as being Bayesian, the idea of kind of updating your beliefs as you move forward. So I think, uh, you know, I wasn't... So you're I, referring more to a Bayesian philosophy as opposed to... Yeah, 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 to, yeah right? right. So I think, you know, I think uh, some, of the, uh, some of the critiques took to literally the sense, so you should only apply these particular methods, right, where there's maybe a, a kind of frequentist technique you can apply in a Bayesian way, right. I suppose, or maybe vice versa. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Um, uh, and actually, I guess I lied, because there is one more thing I want to touch on before we open it up, and that's um, you had some strong words for um, the punditocracy. Um, uh, there are um, uh, a, a number of columnists I think we probably both have some problems with. Um, but what I find particularly frustrating is um, columnists who assert things with no factual basis yeah. and then claim that, <laughs> glad you agree, um, uh, and, then, and, and then claim if you criticize the fact that they have no factual basis, um, they say, well, what they're doing is exercising their right to voice their opinion. It's just an opinion, man. Right. No, I, 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 <laughs> You know, that's Apparently, the they also smoke yeah. a lot of pot. Yeah, <laughs> that's the wonderful thing about uh, about prediction, though, is that if you're making a prediction, a true out of sample prediction, not a model that was fit to pass data, then you're actually putting uh, putting your opinion on the line, right? And you're testing whether your perceptions have any correspondence to reality. And, and um, I'm not just being cheeky. I mean, you see, uh, Phil Tetlock was a guy who. Uh, who uh, used to work at Berkeley is now at, at Penn, a psychologist, and he studied over 20 years how well the, um, the predictions of political experts do. And so that included people you think of as pundits, also um, academics and journalists um, and, uh, and people on the inside of politics and found that they weren't really any better than, than random for the most part. Right. And there were some exceptions. There were people who have certain personality traits, um, what he called uh, foxes instead of hedgehogs, who did right. a little bit better. Um, but um, but the industry has a history of getting things wrong, right? Uh, what was kind of amazing, too, is that you had people who, um, you know, some very, very smart conservatives like George Will and Michael Barone, who were not just asserting that, um, uh, well, it's close and a Romney could win Ohio, right? Uh, but we're predicting a Romney landslide in contradiction to all <laughs> available evidence. Or, and, and Peggy Noonan, also yeah. very smart, who's saying that the fact that she saw Romney yard signs meant that there was a groundswell in the country as a whole. Yeah, so her, you know, her neighborhood, her Tony neighborhood in Virginia or whatever, right, you know, and people at their Georgetown, I mean, this really is like, uh, <clears throat> you have a better source. So the idea that she could read the average voter better than the actual random voters who were like literally called by the polls, right? That's, I mean, that's the, the pretense behind why, um, what organizations like the, the Times sponsor polls actually is that. So you have reporters who, um, who report and although they're gonna represent the kind of expert or elite consensus, you also wanna hear from the man or woman on the street and what better way to do that than to randomly survey uh, random men and women on, on the street. street right? um, and lo and behold, polls do, do fairly well about um, under certain assumptions, right? People are bad and polls are bad at explaining why people believe what they do. Um, and people are bad at predicting their behavior far in the future. But for the most part, if you ask someone who you're going to vote for tomorrow, then they'll give you an a, a, a honest response. We know that empirically. Um, right. And it's a lot better than trying to count up the number of yard signs or something. So, so the fact that, that Peggy Noonan obviously continues to be employed by the Wall Street Journal, it, is that, is that um, do you think that's indicative of uh, the sort of power of narrative and that she is a very good writer and, and is an she's a very She's writer? a superlative writer. Yeah. Or, or, um, or is it, it, does that have more to do with um, the fact that we now can create these information cocoons and we're getting more and more used to only consuming the information that um, is going to validate our worldview. It's 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 both, and I'm trying to figure out which of those. You know, but I actually think the the latter concern. So kind of the the story I tell in in the first book, the signal and noise, is kind of the story about well, well, our brains are wired to detect 
patterns and to build stories around essentially random data. And, and that's a big part of it. But I do think these kind of information feedback loops is a bigger and bigger element of the story as well, where if you look at the demographics, actually the, the Wall Street Journal is an exception where it has a fairly bipartisan audience. Um, but, uh, but, you know, only 5% of the people who watch uh, Sean Hannity on a given night <clears throat> are Democrats, right? Only 2% right. of people who watch Rachel Maddow on a given night are Republicans. So you really have people consuming the news in two different ways. One thing I'd like to do is go back uh, in a, maybe a somewhat formal way and study which polls were cited, um, were cited by the media most often and when. Because this seems like a fairly tangible way to test media bias, right? If you, um, if you have two polls, for example, I remember late in the campaign there was a case where you had two polls came out on the same day in, uh, in Minnesota, one of which had Obama up only three points, suggesting it was in play, one of which had him up eight, right? Um, and the poll that had him up three points, um, showing it competitive, was cited like five or six times more often, right? The only reason for that was because you want to create the narrative of the, the campaign still. That's, but that's still really the story close. bias, right? Yeah, that's I'm, not not saying, a... I'm not saying, believe me, I'm not saying that the uh, media has a Republican leaning bias, believe me. Uh, but I think it does. No, have but a, that, was, that was a bias for a story. You have a bias for, for a story, right? You see this absolutely in the. In the uh, in the general election campaign, but also at the end of the primary campaign, where um, where people were writing, you know, when Rick Santorum was was hundreds of delegates behind and really didn't have a viable path unless there was some major scandal involving Romney. People were saying, well, you know, Romney must win this Illinois primary, or well, or, or what? Then he'll only be 180 delegates ahead, right? right? Um, you know, so the primaries, especially to some extent in in 2008, also with with Clinton versus. Um, Obama, that was a little closer than But later than in that, that, that occurred. But yeah, later, later you're kind of playing out the, the string a little bit. Um, unless you had some monumental event occurring, then, uh, then you know, that outcome was, was preordained for the most right, part. Right, right. Um, all right, well, why don't we open it up? We have two um, microphones. Uh, <laughs> we're going to try and keep the questions pretty short to um, about a minute so that we can ask as many as possible. Uh, why don't we start over here? Oh yeah, and please, um, please identify uh, yourself um, so we know who to come after afterwards um, uh, when you're at the mic. Hi, uh, thanks very much. I'm Ian Condry, and I'm a professor here in comparative media studies. Uh, really enjoy your stuff. It's really interesting. My question is about political reporting and these questions of objective, subjective, because I certainly agree there's a problem with media bias, but I, I wonder if there's not also a danger of too much accuracy. Uh, and this has sort of been too uh, much, well, too accuracy much. Uh, okay. and predictive power. I mean, one of the things that's so frustrating, I think, about the political campaigns is the oversimplification of red and blue, uh, the emphasis on only the swing states, the undecided voters, and then, of course, at the last minute, somehow it's all about the base uh, that needs to get out. And there's a kind of common narrative. But I wonder if there's a point where you, the predictive power of 538 uh, becomes kind of self-reinforcing, right? Does it... Do, really lead to a decline in democratic participation because we think it's already decided. I mean, certainly in the, the red and blue already decided states, that happens to some extent. Uh, and I think in, in some ways, because we still didn't trust you until this election, <laughs> that, that now it, it's, you know, I wonder if it changes the dynamic now that it, it, 538 is so accurate, did so well, that then we, do we even need voting? And I'm wondering, what's your... <laughs> yeah, I, I hope people don't... Uh... Well, that's my question, is sort of in your sort of self-reflexive and thinking about your role in this, what do you think about that problem? Um, you know, as I've said before, if I, if I feel like uh, 538's forecasts are actually influencing voting behavior, then that would be a very dangerous precedent, I think. Although I would say, uh, you know, uh, media coverage in general influences elections, especially in, in the primaries, for example, where, where one case, for example, in the GOP primary this year, for some reason the kind of media decided early on that, uh, that Gary Johnson was not a, a serious candidate for some reason, even though credential-wise he was someone who had been elected governor of a swing state twice, I think, where some other guy who ran a pizza company was more entertaining and so I guess was, was determined to be more viable, right? But you see the media put its finger on the scale in a lot of different ways. Um, and to the extent you have that, then I'd rather have, uh, <laughs> I guess I'd rather have accurate information affecting public sentiment than inaccurate information. But the other point is that, um, you know, I'm not someone who always says that, oh, everything is, uh, is super predictable, right? And people are just being boneheaded about it. If you read the book, then we say a lot of times, in general, more often the opposite error 
it is made where people overrate how predictable things are. And so, um, and so if you see, for example, when you have a, uh, a jobs report come out where say we, uh, we create 20,000 jobs in a month where we're supposed to create 90,000 or something, right? Those types of errors happen all the time. On average, the miss is about 70,000 or 80,000 jobs, but it's always seen as you know, a catastrophic mistake. And people don't understand how much economic uncertainty there is, for example. So, um, so you know, I mean, part of it is, uh, is I think, journalists uh, seeing empiricism as kind of <laughs> the enemy and, and seeing, looking at the, the work that academics do and, and more technical analysis. I think, I think that's more the problem than, um, than, uh, than saying everything is up for grabs because sometimes the opposite mistake is made instead. So, and you did, you did say recently that if in 2014 or 2016 you saw 538 influencing elections in some way that you might then step away from it because that would make you feel uncomfortable. So specifically, what, what did you mean? How would you see 538 influencing elections? I mean, if, I think it's probably more of a risk in, say, uh, individual campaigns for the U.S. House or something, where, or one case where, uh, where the polls probably do matter some is in a stage where you have candidates competing with another for scarce resources. So in the primaries, for example, uh, Tim Pawlenty's people uh, quit the campaign. In retrospect, uh, Tim Pawlenty and his people quit the campaign. Right? In retrospect, they could maybe have, Too have won. Who, right. who knows, right? Um, but they felt like they were far behind enough where uh, in the polls where they were not going to get donations from, from leading Republicans and therefore they couldn't build out the campaign so it kind of became a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you have cases like that. So if you have cases, for example, where, um, where you have influential Republican donors or Democratic donors trying to figure out which Senate campaign do I donate to and they go to 538 and they see that, well, in this campaign, the GP candidate has a 30% has a chance of winning. They're still very viable. I'll give money to them. And not the candidate who has a five percent chance of winning instead, and that kind of that might be a way in which uh, in which the outcome is is influenced potentially. But why? So why would that? I'm, I'm not entirely clear on why that would make you uncomfortable. Because isn't that a valid data point for them to make those decisions? I, I, guess, on? I guess that's a counterpoint, right? Is uh, is uh, you know, look, that information's out there, and if you aggregate it in a more efficient way, then you shouldn't be be scared of <laughs> of having more disclosure, basically. Uh, right. But remember, you know, implicitly models are. Um, are based on the assumption that, um, I don't know. I mean, there, there are some kind of academic questions, I guess, about, uh, about do you have a model which is premised on the notion that people don't know what the model says, and then does the behavior like change as a result? So one problem we had, for example, in, in 2010 is we had um, races for individual US House seats in 2010, which we mm -hmm. didn't do in 2012. We will again in 2014. Um, but one of the inputs to that, to that model was the forecast made by independent analysts like Cook Political, who have a very good track record, right? But we were basically free riding off them. But the problem is that, uh, you know, I know the Cook Political guys, the organizations that do this, and they would read 538, and they would say, well, you guys uh, in this county right. have a 90% chance of winning, so we're going to so upgrade feedback them loop. from safe, uh, or from, you know, leaning re Republican to safe Republican or whatever, right? So you have a feedback loop right. effect instead. So we're going to cut that out of the model in, um, in 20. 14, I think. You mean cut out the, the using things like Cook Political So this is a, a slightly esoteric point, but I think uh, if you build a, a, a forecast model, I think the metric um, you should use, it's not solely about, um, solely about how accurate are, are you are, but it's how much value kind of do you add. So if you have a, right. a model that like basically, and there's some models like this that, um, that for example, take what Intrade says, which are prediction markets, and then, and then uh, and then slightly tweak that or something, right? If you're trying to gamble on an event, then, um, then that might be best. But you're probably adding very little value to the overall public knowledge. You're basically free riding off predictions that everyone else has made. To the extent that you can say, here's an approach that's more proprietary, right? And here's the value that it adds, I think, is, is, is preferable. And so to trying to avoid those, uh, those feedback loops, I think, would be right. one small step there. Yes. Hi, Nate. John Hawkinson, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, my question for you it kind of reflects, I think, what a lot of people I know uh, would want to ask you, which, and apparently the person in the line behind me, too. Uh, go figure. Uh, <laughs> what are the chief impediments to open sourcing your model, or, or a variant of it, or a historical version of it? Because people want to play. To open sourcing the model? Well, first of all, it's not that hard to, to reverse engineer it, necessarily. But, you know, I mean, the, you know, it's... Uh, I am very sympathetic to the kind of academic viewpoint that science should be should be open source, right? But I, you know, I don't have a, a tenure track <laughs> position. Um, you know, I make money in part from my ability to license proprietary 
content, and if you open source something, then uh, then you know that value is diminished. But I never, I would never ever rule out that I wouldn't do it. You know, one one solution maybe to um, if I do feel like I get bored of this or 538. Uh, is influencing thing too much is just to publish the source code and say now it's in the public domain and go ahead and, and have fun with it. But I do think we can reach a, um, a, a better level of disclosure where things are more explicit. If you go back to 2008, things were, were fairly explicit about, how, uh, about uh, how we disclose things, but we didn't release the source code. We didn't release uh, um, the actual database of polls. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, like I said, I'm still taking the point of view that it should be completely open source, but, you know, I am a, uh, it is a for-profit business, and that influences things at the well, moment. Well, maybe next year we could see last year's model. Last year, well, the model shouldn't change all that much right. from year to year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, Nate, I'm Ryan, uh, political junkie, so that's why I'm here. Uh, I wanted to ask you, so um, basically, in order to forecast, you have to understand the system you're forecasting for. Um, and I think kind of your hallmark right now is the Electoral College. Um, and you've kind of voiced, I think, pretty clearly that you're opposed to it, that you think probably a direct PR vote or a direct vote would be better, a popular vote. Um, and that's great. In terms of, I mean, I think it's a pretty simple explanation for a unitary executive. I'm wondering for congressional and parliamentary systems, if you have an opinion on what might be a better way for elections to work, like there's, you know, because there's a lot of debate in that theory, whether like an AV, an AV plus, mixed PR, stuff like that, the way systems could be used for congressional and representative elections, if you have a, an opinion on what might be best. I mean, the funny thing is that the, uh, <clears throat> um, in some ways the Senate is odder in that you have as many senators in California as you do in Wyoming, but you're actually getting more of a skew now in the House of Representatives, neither the Senate, uh, uh, or uh, the Electoral College, because you have Democrats concentrate in big cities like like Boston and, and Chicago. And you just and wrote York. about this in the last day or two, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and in some ways, the fact that you know, so so states happen to work out fairly well, where um, where most states have a combination of urban areas and rural areas, but congressional districts where you really are packing Democrats in, or I shouldn't use the active voice necessarily, um, where Democrats are kind of packing themselves into big cities right. now. Um, sometimes abetted by by gerrymandering in states where Republicans control the process, but um, but yeah, that has interesting implications where um, where this urban rural divide, um, you know, the, the the Constitution kind of part by X and part by design tends to give slightly more voice to, to rural areas, relatively speaking. Um, you know, people talk to you about well, are the Republicans at a disadvantage in the race for the presidency? Well, well, maybe, but also they're doing well in rural areas. That means they are going to always do well on the race for the House, for example. So trying, if the party's trying to optimize its overall political fortune, there might be kind of a, a quasi-stable equilibrium where Democrats do have an edge in the presidency, but the, the price for that is that in midterms where you have um, grow, voting groups like young voters and Hispanics, African Americans are less likely to turn out, um, where the, the way district structure tends to favor rural areas a bit more, you, you'll kind of have, you know, maybe we'll have a Democratic president and Republican House for, for a very long time, so, so get used to it. The current gridlock, I suppose. Woohoo! Yes. Hi, I'm Rachel. Um, I'm just a student here, but I was wondering. You were talking earlier about the issue of punditry in the media, um, and also about the issue of feedback loops, and just like what thoughts you have on the the media's ability to fix that problem, since people do pay for the media that they want to receive and they want to hear the things they want to hear. <laughs> so it's. Um, <clears throat> It's a difficult problem, and you know, one thing I've been thinking about is it's fun to uh, to critique individual journalists who kind of are are doing things in kind of a silly way, but um, but you know, their self interest is often in providing coverage that's sensationalistic, right? Um, and so now I'm in a position now where, look, I've uh, I work for the Times and I'm published the book, and you know, I have enough income now where I can say, well, I can be magnanimous and kind of seek after the truth, and I always have done that throughout my career. But it's easier to do that when um, when you have the, the luxury of doing that instead of someone who's, who's struggling to make a name for themselves um, and, uh, and, uh, and you know, publishes some link bait um, that's trolling Nate Silver or something as a result, or that's hyping up, less than that, that's hyping up the result of some poll because they have to meet a quota for how much traffic they get. And I don't necessarily have a good sense for how to, to solve those problems. I do think, and maybe this is a romantic idea that, um, that sometimes journalists uh, or news organizations think too much about how many page views something get 
in the short term as opposed to what's it say about your brand uh, in, in the longer term, right? Um, that when you link to something that's stupid, then, um, then there are two things that happens. Number one, is that, uh, number one is that you're hurting your brand in the long term. Number two is that it's easy to compete with stupid, right? Um, you know, anyone can, uh, can link to someone else's articles and do this kind of cheap little value add aggregation, right? Um, and so you know, you're not going to have a, an advantage in that department for a very long time. And so, um, so how can you be differentiating is a question I would ask. But, but for people who are kind of engaged in the career being a, a, a political reporter or something, then it's, 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 it's more difficult potentially. I think you have to have look more at the organizational level in terms of, of what values does the organization have and how are they incentivizing their people and do they care about their, their brand. And do, do you think that there's any possibility that news consumers will start to um, play a more active role? I, 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 and I guess this is my sense of things and not based on actually any data, um, but my sense is that as consumers, we're still uh, functioning as we were 20 years ago. So sort of assuming that there are these big media um, conglomerates that essentially are working on similar stories and have similar storylines, where that's obviously not true. And it seems like we have a ways to go before um, the, the active intelligence of news consumers kind of catches up to their influence in the process. Well, I mean, part of what I, I do resent about, um, about, for example, Politico is that they, they do treat the, uh, the reader as being an idiot a lot of the time. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think, look, not everyone's going to want the kind of wonky, nerdy coverage that Meaning, meaning what? Meaning that they don't, uh, you know, they, 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 they think that per people are going to, um, you know, don't see the forest for the trees, basically, right? Um, and I think that, uh, that if they say, well, you know, the race is rapidly shifting, that people are just going to buy that and not have their own, their own scrutiny of it necessarily. And very often throughout the campaign you saw um, events. So, for example, uh, people may remember after the, uh, the attacks in, in Benghazi, which is now seen as, uh, as a failure on the part of the White House, right? But there was this kind of very arbitrary media consensus that, um, that Mitt Romney's reaction to Benghazi right. was a big story, would really hurt him in the campaign. And it didn't really move the polls very much at all, right? Um, but you know, I think, I think the news media tends to have an overly simplistic, simplistic view of how, of how voters think about elections, where voters might not think about it exactly like, like someone in the Beltway establishment might, but they do have their own way. People think about presidential elections pretty carefully, where, for example, the heuristic that people use to measure economic growth is, is arguably pretty sophisticated, where it's not just, um, oh, how good is the economy right now, but actually looking at, um, is the economy getting better or worse? And I'm going to look at it relative to the baseline of a couple of years ago and, and not over the longer term, because that's a way to assign more credit or blame to, to the incumbent. Right. right. Um, and so you had a case like this year where the unemployment rate was, uh, was you know, 8% on election day, or also in 1984 where it was 7.5%, where you had incumbents in Ronald Reagan's case, a landslide, but elected easily and then not so easily, but clearly enough because you had economic progress being made. Um, whereas some reporters were like, oh, economy bad, voters toss out incumbent. It's like, no, actually people are like a little bit more sophisticated than that if you read the political science on it, then it describes what, what should have occurred. But, um, but Politico is, is actually, um, from, a, from a, a financial standpoint, I would, I would argue a journalistic success story over the last you know, five years. I, you know, I don't know much about their, their finances. Um, right. I mean, look, there's going to be a market for, uh, for certain things. And one, one secret about being a, a, uh, a, um, a rag, I guess, targeted toward Beltway Insiders is that, um, is that it's very advantageous to reach that crowd with lobbying money, in essence. So if you have sites that are targeted for inside audiences, you can make incredible CPMs um, by you know, running ads for clean coal or whatever and else. CPMs or, being? Uh, being how much you get per ad per, impression, right? right? Uh, by orders of magnitude higher than reading it to a general audience because you are literally reaching uh, congressmen and, and senators and staffers on the Hill and people who are peddling influence in different ways, right? Um, so there is definitely a market um, for an insider audience right. uh, that, can, that can sustain a certain number of reporting organizations. You know, I happen to think that, um, that kind of the traditional ones like, like Roll Call and the National Journal and stuff do a somewhat better job with their reporting than, than Politico does 
for example. Um, but um, but that's certainly a market niche, uh, and I do think that um, this demand for for data driven coverage or you know kind of wonky political journalism um, is also a market niche, right? I think it's not going to ever displace Peggy Noonan terribly, but I think it might be that it's something that 20% of, of consumers want, um, and it represents 5% of the coverage. And so right now, you still have things like uh, where I think uh, people like me are, are in demand. You probably see an increase until it reaches that equilibrium, and then maybe kind of goes over it in some sense, right? Like in baseball, for example, I feel as though um, there are plenty of, of stat heads providing very, very good analysis, right? So there's no more low-hanging fruit as far as we have a more quantitatively flavored coverage, right? The market's pretty saturated at this point. Right, right. So at, at, I'm not in the prediction game, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Politico is not one of the news organizations that you're in <laughs> negotiations with. No, they're, they're not, although maybe for an April Fool's joke, I was thinking about like... Uh, right. <laughs> um, yes? Hi, I'm Charles. I'm just a lowly undergrad. Um, and I was actually worried that the guy in front of me stole my question, but thankfully he went in a different direction. Um, basically what I was wondering is this. Whatever your personal opinions about the Electoral College versus national popular vote, would you say that you have something of a vested interest in our keeping it just because uh, it makes the minutiae of state polling so much more relevant and it gives you so much more material? So, I mean, the Electoral College is like a super interesting modeling problem, actually. Um, where, so the two assumptions that are clearly false are to assume that uh, you don't want to assume that every state is independent from the next one. Clearly, when, uh, when you had, for example, this is very easy to perceive, when you had Obama surge after the Democratic Convention, he moved up by, by about the same amount in every state. When you had, um, when you had Romney surge after the first debate, um, about the same amount in every state, a little bit of, of difference around the margin, right? But, um, but how do you uh, strike that balance between assuming the outcomes are perfectly correlated versus perfectly independent. That's an interesting challenge. And that's kind of one of the things that, uh, that you know, it would be worth like, getting into technical debates about, because I think we had a pretty good, um, although too complicated to explain in a forum, but kind of methodology for that. So it's, it's definitely more interesting in that sense. It adds a layer of, of intrigue to it. So for purely selfish reasons, yeah, in, in the name of the site, 538 is based on the number of votes in Electoral College, right? So uh, you know, we had a situation a couple of years ago where uh, where when Democrats controlled Congress, they almost gave D.C. a seat in the House. It would have she been would 539. Have screwed. I know, yeah. <laughs> but fortunately for me, you know, the NRA somehow tied this bill to a bill on gun control, and so it got stymied in committee, and so, you know. Uh, 539 is much less mellifluous than 538. I think so. It would have been, uh, and someone else had already registered it instead, so. Um, <laughs> So I'm really against, uh, in a selfish way, against you know Puerto Rico gaining <laughs> statehood. Or... <laughs> have, you, have you now gone and registered 540 and 541? Oh, it's and... too late now. In fact, it was quite. I mean, every number spelled out and written from zero to like six thousand or something is now is probably, now taken, yeah. right? And uh, if I'm allowed to do like a quick follow-up, yeah. um, on very similar lines, if we somehow move to a national popular vote, whether by interstate compact or somehow constitutional amendment, uh, beyond just changing the name, what would you do if 538 is still active at that time? I mean, you'd still do forecast. One, uh, one point we tried to make uh, during uh, this last campaign is that even absent the Electoral College, that, that state polls provide a lot of information mm -hmm. about where the national popular vote is. We can, you know, if you want to estimate what will the national popular vote be, there are two ways. You can just say, will average the national polls. Or the other approach is to, uh, is to see, you know roughly how many voters vote in every state, then average each state poll and add that together. And it turns out that second approach actually seems to work a bit better, in part because you have more, more data points. So that's a case where actually doing a bit more work. You know, in general, I think one theme about modeling is that you, know, you get very diminishing returns to adding complexity to your model. That's a case where, where you have enough, the data is more robust if you're averaging from the individual states. And so it could have still been useful in some ways. But it'd be, it would definitely be um, be less interesting as a modeling problem, I suppose. Yes. Hi, Nate. Uh, my name is Michael Stepner. I'm a research assistant who does work with uh, big data doing economic research. And my question is this. It seems like you have uh, the presidential prediction model down pat. You're doing pretty well at it. And looking at your uh, career, it seems like you enjoy building models. So I guess my question is, uh, what do you see as your future in terms of technical innovations? Um, is it kind of improving uh, your 
existing models? Is it building new political models or going in new directions? Uh, well, Maybe that's you know, secret, but we were talking before <laughs> we're about the history of kind of once I, I get bored of doing things every four years and kind of veer off in an unpredictable direction. Uh, you know, one area that I find interesting. So I did a project for uh, for for New York Magazine in 2010, where we rated uh, different neighborhoods, and of course, it's a magazine, so they want some objective answer for which is the best neighborhood. But my whole point was that well, you get to weigh the factors that you want that you find in a neighborhood that's a comparative advantage relative to your price point. But, but you know, urban data, for lack of a better term, um, data about cities, um, is another case where you have a data set that's, that's somewhat rich, but it's maybe not being used all that well. And so you could kind of strike that, that middle ground, potentially. Um, but yeah, I definitely will get, uh, you know, it's fun to, to kind of be more abstract and, and write and talk about this stuff. But at some point, I'm sure I'll have the temptation to go uh, delve into a big new data set because that modeling is, is a lot of fun, right? Um, when it's a fresh problem and you're not just kind of making improvements around the, the margin. It turns out that 539, 540, 541, and 542 are also all taken as Twitter handles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 543, however, is available. Um, yes. Hi, Nate. Uh, Sonny Sidhu. I'm a graduate student in the Comparative Media Studies program. Just wanted to thank you and, and you, Seth, for it's been a really great discussion. Um, so my question actually has to do with, I, I think that it's really clear now that there's a lot to be gained from taking a data-driven and, and model-informed approach to political campaigns. I'm wondering, do you see much of a, a room to grow in terms of applying that approach to policy and to governance rather than just the horse race coverage of, of political campaigns? And so. I think in the same way that it's just more productive and insightful and fun to talk about baseball when you're talking about wins above replacement and not yeah. fielding percentage and wins and losses. Uh, it, I, I think that there's some debates that could be richer in this country if we moved away from um, sort of misleading and reductive approaches to data. So for example, we've got this makers versus takers debate that's going nowhere because it's informed by this really silly model that you know if you subtract somebody's social program benefits from their federal tax payments then you can tell whether they're a maker or a taker so what, what i'm wondering is why don't we have a better way of talking about these issues do we need something akin to like a bureau of advanced labor statistics or are there people <laughs> in government doing this good work and people just aren't talking about I, it? well if you talk to people in um and I live in New York, but if you do talk to people in the Treasury Department, for example, they're actually pretty darn sophisticated about some of the analysis they're doing, but it's different when you have to communicate that to, <laughs> to the public, I think. Um, but you know, you do have, for example, the work that, uh, that Ezra Klein does at the Washington Post mm -hmm. in some way is a model of that, where it's a more data-driven um, driven approach to things and some of the economics bloggers. Um, I find myself actually doing um, a little bit less of that, in part because uh, other people do it do it well, but I do think it becomes uh, trickier. We have these problems that are more open-ended, um, you know. So I guess it is kind of a, a um, you know, polling is a simple set of facts, like I've said, um, and so you can kind of work with it and say, look, if you're not getting, you can't take the average. If you're getting that wrong, then you're demonstrably being an idiot at this point, right? Um, but other things like, you know, what will the effect of um, Obamacare be on the healthcare system is a more, uh, it's you know, it's very good to have data-driven approaches, but it's a more complicated set of facts. So in some ways, it's a cop-out for me to say, here's a field where it's easy to do this stuff, and there's not as much ambiguity, and I'll let, um, let Ezra and everyone else do the tough stuff instead. Um, but there's no doubt that, I mean, that would be really valuable. I think it's probably a little bit uh, optimistic to assume that that's what people are really interested <laughs> in. I think there's a market for, um, for data-driven coverage of elections because it seems like it's actually telling you more of the essence of something than, than you would have gotten before. Um, but you know, it's hard, to, I think, to separate out uh, your your partisan desires maybe from your analysis if you're in if you're in the policy arena because the set of facts are more are more ambiguous potentially. Um, but you know, in some ways, also you do have good debates about some of these topics in uh, in academic circles. And I'm someone who you know I try and read academic journals as well as the Wall Street Journal, I guess. And um, and there are blogs like the Monkey Cage, for example, that are trying to um, take academic political science and and interpret it in ways that the journalists are going to read. I very much support, uh, support those efforts as well. Yeah. Hi. My name is Ethan Wolfman, and I'm a journalist for USA Today. I, uh, you, know, you said earlier people love to build kind of stories from very scant data and find patterns in this <laughs> stuff. How do we make sure that 
you know, our politicians don't <coughs> do this, and why does this happen? And if I can rephrase the question, or do you have any interest in politics? Well, of course, politicians build bullshit from from limited supporting evidence. Yeah, I, I think one of the uh, one thing that's maybe under remarked upon is is how um, the professionalization of politics, which is not anything new, but has been happening for for a long time. Um, but the average tenure now of a senator or a congress uh, person is as long as a Supreme Court justice, um, where it's like eighteen years or something on average. Um, and you have people who have become more and more sophisticated in in manipulating public opinion, I suppose. And it's kind of the downside, I guess, to, to big data, where on the one hand, you can, you can say, well, uh, this voter targeting stuff that, uh, that Obama did is, is really admirable from the standpoint of, of you know, solving a difficult data challenge, but it's also kind of creepy, <laughs> maybe potentially, too, where they know that much about you based on your name and, and you know, kind of what websites you're looking at and, and whatever else. And so I think there is a real downside to that, where maybe politics has become kind of too, um, too efficient for its own good, where they're very good at, at kind of optimizing their actions relative to voter opinion in the near term. And as a result, um, long-term problems become more and more neglected. Uh, people are better about realizing what do we have to do to get reelected every two years or four years or six years. And you know that might have uh, negative externalities, I guess, for, for the rest of society. But is it, is it possible that as the professionalization of politics um, gets codified even more, that voters then will start to realize the effects of going after those short-term payoffs and will start to develop a longer-term view? Uh, I mean, could that Potentially. Could that I mean, it's, and this, is a very, this is a very kind of, uh, you know, David Brooksian yeah, right. notion. No, no, no. Some, well, we should, it, we no, should no, just no, stop no. things right but, there then. But if some <laughs> candidate gets up and, and you know, and, uh, and says, well, let's, you know, build a, a policy based on sustainability about the the national debt and about the, uh, the environment and America's place in the world. I mean, that's very compelling to me, right? Um, but, but I don't know. I mean, you haven't really seen it. I don't think either party has been very uh, courageous, I suppose, right? Um, but, uh, you know, so you now have Chris Christie, for example, who is disinvited from this. From uh, CPAC. From CPAC, right. for instance. Um, I mean, that's one of the ironic things is Chris Christie's a guy who um, probably right now is the second most popular active politician in America after after Hillary Clinton, I mean, that's pretty close, um, but probably can't get his party's nomination, you know, um, and that's and, an interesting. And, and you, seem, you, you seem to think that he, that you don't place a, a lot of stock in independent campaigns for president, but you seem to well, think, think that if, he's if, a possibility. If he decided early on that he wanted to do it, and he has some, first of all, again, so to have someone who is that, that popular but couldn't get nominated, it's a fairly rare overlap, um, but, you know, he's also in the, in the New York New Jersey mega region, and so you know you're going to have access to people. So you probably would need, I think, um, financial backing, whether you like it or not. Right? You probably want a super PAC to back you. Um, so I mean, you know, it's not impossible. So I know the history of, of this is always kind of the journalist's pipe dream of having a, an independent candidate or a, a another three-way election like you had in '92. But it does seem like um, if he decided today um, that I want to run a serious third uh, party candidates for the presidency in 2016, then he'd have a shot at winning, right? Um, maybe not as good as, as it might seem, but you know, it's, it's a viable path, and at some point it might become a more viable path for him than, than trying to win the Republican primary. Right. Well, certainly right now it seems like there's, I mean, not getting invited to CPAC is, is not a small Definitely. I mean, deal. The thing is he really is, and this is part of the point of the column, is that he, you know, he really is a moderate on, on quite a few issues. Right. And you'll see, you know, I've written this a couple times, versions of it, and you've had you know, Democrats push back and say, well, he's not, about, he's not a you know, conservative on these and that issues. Well, yeah, that's how it works, right? He, on some issues, he's, <laughs> right. he's center or center left. On, on some slightly more issues, he's right or, or center right. Um, but it's actually what a moderate governorship would, um, a Republican would look like, like nowadays. And so, um, so you know, this question, well, wasn't, didn't Romney govern as a moderate here in Massachusetts? And he, he did, but you know, one thing about Romney is that Romney was always pretty, um, it was kind of an interesting experiment in, in what happened if you had no long-term <laughs> consistency at all in your policies, right? Like maybe it's a dual equilibrium situation where you, you should either be really consistent or not consistent at all, right? Because then there's no cost anymore to being labeled a flip-flopper when people already have priced that in, right? right, right. Um, whereas Christie's brand is more, he's someone who speaks his mind and has a lot of integrity. And so ironically, there's more of a cost uh, for him to flip-flop later on and cater to the Republican base because he has a reputation for, for not doing so. Right. Which side were we? We're here. Yeah. 
Hi, uh, I'm Jack Lieberson. I'm a grad student in the financial economics program. Um, I was wondering, Nate, uh, more young people have cell phones and not landlines. Um, how well you think traditional phone polling is going to be able to uh, adjust for those changes and whether um, online polling or, or something else is going to supplant it in the future? I think polling has already built that in. Yeah, so, so most of the, uh, the New York Times poll and the NBC poll, most of the credible mainstream media polls do include cell phones. Um, you know, the Rasmussen's and public policy pollings of the world do not, and they by and large did not do very well. Um, and, and do you weight the do you weight polls that include cell phone surveys differently? Yeah, so uh, so that's it's part a, of the secret sauce. Well, it's it's disclosed somewhere in some right, article, right. But, but, um, but, the, but basically, the relative so, weighting. so one thing we do is we adjust, uh, we calculate pollster house effects, which is kind of what does the average pollster say, right? And if you have a poll who's consistently uh, two points more Republican leaning than the average, you just kind of take those two points back out. Um, but the question is, what do you mean by, by average? It's not actually the average, but it's an average which is weighted based on, on different criteria, how well the pollsters are doing in the long term. And that, that consensus only uses uh, telephone polls that include cell phones, right? Um, so you're looking at how do these polls compare relative to, um, to these kind of um, premium polls that are expensive. And, and that's where you adjust everything else to. So that's where you have an implicit cell phone adjustment. But you actually did have. Um, a number of polls that were conducted online um, this past year that actually did better than anything else. Um, and if you look at the graph... Better than any of the telephone polling? Better than, I mean, the telephone polling that included cell phones was, was fairly good for the most part, but the online polls were um, almost eerily accurate in a number of cases. Um, and so if you kind of look at the graph of what's um, internet penetration versus what is landline penetration, right? Well, you know, that, those wires crossed um, a couple of years ago. Um, so I... I would think the equilibrium that you might have in the long term um, is that you'll have, uh, instead of having these robo polls like Rasmussen and PPP, you'll have, you'll still have a role for expensive traditional telephone polling, and it'll get more and more expensive. They have to call more cell phones, and you'll have that supplemented by by kind of cheap um, Internet online, online polls right. instead. Although one issue also is that uh, is that um, you know sometimes you say, well, for example, these robo polls that are using automated scripts. They had a bad 2012. They haven't done that badly over the long run, but there's some evidence that they actually calibrate themselves off the good polls. So ah. they're uh, so they're free riding right. a bit. So that's another issue where um, we have to um, probably introduce some assumptions about what's going to lead to better poll quality in the long term when you're weighing polls, and not just assume that you can't be purely results oriented right. about that for that right. free riding reason. Right. Yes. Hi, Nate. Uh, my name's Nick. I'm a big fan of yours, going back to the BP days. So it's been great to see all the mainstream success. Um, I remember when Pakoda Baseball first. Baseball isn't mainstream. I thought <laughs> it moved over. Um, when Pakoda first started out, it um, it pretty it outperformed the other projection systems pretty handily. Um, and as time went by, the gap is kind of closed, and a lot of the the innovations of Pakoda are now being used in other systems. You know, Zips will use percentile forecasts and comparable players. Um, and to be fair, a lot of that happened after you left Pakoda, but the, the gap is, you know, they're, they're all pretty much the same now. So I was wondering if you worry about a similar thing happening to 538 that the other guys will start to catch on. I've heard it said that next election, every media outlet is going to have their own Nate Silver. And so I wonder if, you know, it'll be, what, you know, where is your place in, in that? Oh, world? sure. No, you're going to, and this is why, you know, maybe I'll get into neighborhood prediction instead of, but, uh, but there's no doubt that, uh, that you're going to have people who are, who are uh, who are catching up, and there already were like a number of models that were that were that were pretty good, right? Um, that were had 98 percent of the same DNA as as the 538 model did. Um, and when you say 98 percent of the same DNA, you mean the results tracked 98 percent of the time? The results the, were similar, but also because the process for evaluating data was the methodology. Was, the methodology was was you know even just kind of taking a a um, you know if you look at as you add complexity to a model how the accuracy tracks, right? You do encounter diminishing returns pretty quickly, right? Right. Um, where there's some maximum on how accurate you can even, you can even be intrinsically. Um, and, you know, I think the 538 model does a lot of things well. If I thought I did it wrong, if I thought someone else had a better approach, then I'd duplicate it myself, right? Um, but, um, but you're talking about fairly marginal differences. And you did see that with, with Dakota. Um, and so really it's like, look, um, if I'm competing against, uh, you know, the Bloomberg, model, the Washington Post model, and everyone else's model, then it's not going to do that much better 
over the long term, which is you know why I like this confrontation against the kind of mainstream pundits <laughs> who are just terrible at what they do. It's really right. it's it's very easy to be really bad at things, right? It's a lesson in poker player, right? It's really easy to be incredibly bad at poker, right? Um, and you can be really really dumb if you're on the McLaughlin group every week, but it's hard to, to be that much better than other people. Um, so no, but it is a reason so you why. you have a vested interest in bad pundits keeping their jobs. Well, it is, and it's another poker player thing, right? But, uh, right. but you'd have some poker players who'd always, who'd always kind of berate the fish, right? Like, why'd you play that hand that way? You know, you didn't have the odd straw, you're flush. It's like, well, you make money from that in the long term when people are, are making decisions badly. So I should probably be really nice to Politico right. and stuff. <laughs> if they go out of business, then it's gonna, the competition's gonna get tougher and, and yeah. Um, well, the, uh, you know, this, th that relates a little bit to it's now uh, 30 years since since Bill James introduced um, sabermetric analysis to baseball. He's still extremely popular and and still does a lot of writing, not because what he's doing is unique, but because of his voice and his and and the narrative that he brings to the data that he analyzes. And I think that's I mean, and Bill James is is kind of a hero. Of mine, that's great. I, the, you know, the one thing I do worry about sometimes is that uh, is that if I lend myself my voice, something that will be seen now as 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 like too authoritative, right? We talked about this problem a little bit before, where with the times, it's such a it gets echoed so much, it's hard, hard to kind of whisper something quietly and say, "Oh, well, here's kind of an interesting thing I found in the data." Right? It gets right. blown up and magnified in ways that it's not intended sometimes. Um, so with some of this buzz that surrounded what 538 did in 2012, and I worry it's kind of hard to kind of tiptoe into something more when that's a lot of the way that... So if we see another, a new really interesting blog that's applying statistical analysis to something and written by um, Chili Pepper, we should wonder what you're up to. Maybe, yeah, 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 yeah right? Uh, but you should pay more attention to people who are, who are innovating in, in, in different ways. Uh, you know, I mean, that really is the... People talk about, well, what's the kind of... Um, the money ball approach, people are like, oh, it's about, you know, you favor on base percentage versus batting average. And no, really it's about that you, you innovate relative to, um, to where the conventional wisdom <laughs> Yeah, well, right. and, and, and actually, I mean, the, 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 the misinterpretation of Moneyball as being on base percentage is really important, led to on base percentage being overvalued. Oh, yeah. And you saw shifts where there was one year where, the, uh, where Billy Beans, Oakland A's, drafted like a ton of high school pitchers, right? Because right. the equilibrium had shifted so much. And so I, I guess that is kind of where you, um, you know, I talked before about how 538 involves an element of media <laughs> criticism. But to be competitive, you kind of have to have a sense for what your competition is doing, including kind of what they're what they're doing wrong. And there are definitely right. cases where, um, where I found people are, are acting much too certain about an election outcome. People are putting too much faith in, in models. So, um, but no, I expect that space to get a lot more competitive. And like I said, you had a number of, um, of very good models already in 2012 that were doing 98% uh, of what 538 was doing and in some cases were just as successful. Right. Um, I think we'll take a couple of more questions and, and, and then probably wrap things up. And, uh, and Nate will be out in the lobby um, selling books. Oh, OK. Nate will not be out in the lobby. Um, uh, Nate will stay here. And the, so they should buy the books out there and then bring them here. OK. OK. Most are gone. So if you didn't get one already, too late. Um, yes. Uh, hi. My name is John Trulove. I'm an MIT spouse and big data geek. So uh, my question is, I guess in kind of the story you told about your career is you kind of had these hobbies or interests that you kind of identified as being low-hanging fruit for kind of rigorous analysis. Um, but obviously, you know, it's, it's not just that you kind of haphazardly, you know, fell into them. You, you know, there are some characteristics that you, that you identified that these had. Uh, so I was wondering if you could kind of maybe describe the way you were able to identify these areas that kind of rigorous analysis could uh, greatly improve them, and maybe if, you know, some examples? Well, I, you, you do kind of have this chicken and egg thing where you become curious about something, and it's that because of the kind of data environment it presents, or because you're just kind of a baseball fan, then, then that flows from that. But yeah, I mean, I'm looking for areas that have um, kind of a medium level <laughs> of predictability and a medium level of data quality, sort of, where, um, where, you know, the problems where everything, you know, so for example, many years ago, it was problematic to predict the orbits of, of planets, right? Where some calculations had Jupiter crashing into Saturn every 50 years or something. And now that problem is, is solved, we don't even think of it as being a 
a prediction. If you see a tidal table, it's technically a prediction of when the tide will uh, will peak or when the sunrise and the sunset is, right? But um, but it's so precise, we think of it as being absolute uh, fact now, right? Um, and so that kind of thing is uh, is not that <laughs> is not that interesting because it's kind of been been solved, right? Then you have problems like uh, you know. Um, like trying to improve on the margin on, on economic forecasts, I think. We, we're probably, people have tried to do that for a very long time, and you probably uh, encounter diminishing returns, I think, I think very quickly. Um, so cases where, um, where, for whatever reason, the culture has been uh, against using metrics, the reason why, uh, why I say, well, maybe, um, maybe cities are an interesting case in point is because you have um, Oftentimes, you know, urban bureaucracies that um, they're probably not taking a very data-driven approach to things. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit potentially, or, or education uh, might be another area where you see um, more attempts to be quantitative and evaluating teachers and students. But I have no idea whether those are 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 productive <laughs> and smartly applied or not. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a combination of looking for, for things where you have this medium level of predictability. So it's kind of fun still. Um, there are challenges to be solved, but also that the market's doing a, a bad job by, by comparison. Yes? Hi, Nate. Uh, I'm Michael Chung, a freshman here. Uh, as you've moved from saver metrics into election forecasting, at its base you're still analyzing lots of data, but what are some of the most surprising uh, differences between the two fields? <coughs> um, you know, I think you get more, more vitriol from, from political people than from <laughs> From sports people, the good thing about about uh, wait, so, and and when you say from political people as opposed to sports people, are you talking about um, uh, people involved in politics for, and people involved in sports? Well, you or political I guess you did have writers. The, you did and, have political journalists who were uh, who were kind of anti stat heads. So I mean, maybe you have that same uh, problem within the industry, I suppose. But um, but I do mean that. Well, first of all, people in sports, unless they're Skip Bayless or something like, don't take themselves. Quite as seriously, I don't think, right? Or, or, and even Skip Bayless, or, I've heard Dan a very nice guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, people I think have a sense of humor about it at the end of the day, whereas political people take themselves so seriously a lot of the time and have no. Uh, well, no the stakes are higher. Well, the stakes okay. are higher, but not necessarily in you know. There's not much. Stake. Again, I'll just keep trolling Politico for for fun, right? But the stakes in in you know whether the email to Bob Woodward was correctly characterized as a threat or as a pressure or whatever, there, there are no stakes at all in right. that, right? Um, and there's not much sense of perspective in, uh, in politics about, in political news coverage about, is this story important <laughs> or isn't it important, right? right. Um, it's too much play-by-play, -play, I guess, almost. Um, but I'm sorry, what was the original question? I got <laughs> uh, Just talk about like, some of the most surprising things you've experienced in this new area of forecasting. Yeah, but you know, when when you don't have when you only have an election every four years or something, then it's more it's more it's more difficult, certainly. Um, although you can say you have you know midterm elections and other ways to test to test yourself, but um, but that's part is you had actually in uh, in baseball this kind of money ball revolution happened really pretty quickly where you went um, where you went from in two thousand two the kind of period Michael Lewis was describing where you had the stat head was kind of locked in a in a closet with some Cheetos or something, right? An internet connection to where kind of teams are are having stat heads run their front offices now, including um, you know MIT graduates and and so forth. And so that happened very quickly. But but in sports, you have this thing where where it's very competitive. You have a fairly objective way to um, to to test success and failure. Of course, there's definitely luck involved in sports. But um, but that combination is actually quite rare. Um, so the Moneyball story is more an exception than the rule, where you have the combination of things were done badly for a long time beforehand, and you have good ways to incentivize and measure success. So you had very quick progress in that field where you might not in, in other domains as much. So uh, one, one uh, a question that has come in a couple of times from, um, from outside of this room. Uh, I think among science writers and science communicators, um, there's a fair amount of uh, thought slash anxiety about the best way we can reach the public. Um, are there lessons from what you do and the success that you've been able to have that science writers can take away in, in terms of how um, we can use statistics or statistical analysis to communicate the stories that we're trying to tell more effectively? You know, I mean, I, I spoke earlier about having a lot of, uh, <clears throat> having a lot of respect for, um, 
for the reader, right? Um, and assuming that, uh, you know, if you're not communicating something to, to the reader, um, then it's often, it's often your fault, right? And I think also if you have trouble communicating something effectively, unless it's very abstract stuff like quantum physics or whatever, I'll give, give a pass to that, please, right? Um, right? But if you're having trouble articulating what an argument is, right, then, um, then you know, maybe it's not a very good argument to begin with. And so going through that process of, of writing and paying attention to your writing is, is important. Um, you know, I think, I think uh, one thing that helps me a lot is uh, someone who's actually been kind of uh, somewhere between being a practitioner where you're building models and working with data and kind of a, a journalist and you're, you're some of both. I mean, that, that skill set. You mean set you're is, some of both. Yeah, is that, yeah. Right, so right. that skill set is kind of, is kind of because of my odd background, but it, that helps a lot, I think. Um, and it also means that when I talk to like scientists for, um, for my book, for example, I can, I can talk to them um, a little bit more as a, as a peer, and I think that you can communicate. And in of course, language. believe me, there are plenty of things that, that go over uh, that go over my head, right? But but still, you can have more of a conversation about. Okay, tell me about how you're actually kind of playing with with this data and what challenges you face. And there should be, I think, a lot more science journalism. But um, but you know, I think having the you know beginning with the inherent skepticism about you know here's some big splashy conclusion that goes against conventional wisdom. Well, as a default, you should be skeptical of that. Conclusion, right? right? Um, right. And you know, but it's not necessarily what uh, what sells books <laughs> and so forth. And in, in does anything sell field. books? <laughs> Going on the Daily Show sells books. I, see, <laughs> I, I, I've been on the Daily Show and it did not sell my book. Um, uh, but it's you know, and you know, all these different formats, books and, and newspapers and magazines have different have different issues. But, right. Um, but I don't know. I mean, at some level, you just have to. You know, this is where I talk about the importance of of kind of. Uh, Branding in the long term, but if you're someone who, who readers, so you do have a relationship where you can develop, or excuse me, you do have the opportunity to develop credibility in a relationship with the readers over the long term, right? right? And if you're someone who, who is seen as, uh, as trying to get things right, then I think I think that does count for something in, in the long term, right? I hope so. Yes, All right, Chris Tam here. I'm an undergraduate. Uh, earlier, you were discussing digital journalism and how the New York Times. This is expertise in that area kind of drew you toward them. Uh, could you elaborate on both your experience and what innovations you see or would like to see that sort of separate an individual paper or person from their competitors? Well, I mean, there, there are a few things here, and I've probably referred to a couple of these in, uh, in passing. But you know, number one is that uh, the visual presentation of materials at times is, is really outstanding, where if there were a Pulitzer for uh, for graphic journalism, they would right. win pretty much, <laughs> pretty much every year. Yeah, I think right? it's the most underrated part of their operation. Yeah, actually, it's, and it's super it's incredible. It's super important, especially when you're taking and you know. And the thing about uh, about the digital journalists, the reason why um, why they insist and I insist on calling them you know journalists is because they understand that part of what you're doing is taking complex information and figuring out a way to convey uh, the essence of that information in a way that's that's accurate. You're telling right? a story with data. You're telling Just a story with, with data. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and sometimes they'll build things in a way that there's one way to look at it, but you can interact and play around with it um, as a reader in different ways and, and uncover more complexity. And in some ways, I think it's a good model even for, um, for written content, right? Where you want to make sure that the, um, <clears throat> that the basic storyline you're telling is true. That if someone just gets, uh, is just reading the article, skimming it, and coming up with one thought that the kind of elevator pitch they're getting is true, but also provide enough detail kind of in, in the footnotes or the links or the discussion at the end or the references to other pieces that, um, that you know, people who want a richer experience can also get that as well. So they, 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 they do that very well. I think they do uh, very good about taking a, a <clears throat> digital first mentality in the event of, of breaking news. So when the Pope announced that he was resigning, for example, um, the front page of the Times had the Twitter feed from the Times Rome Bureau chief, right? Because they realized that was the best way to communicate things um, in a breaking news context instead of waiting for someone to file a story. Um, and so that's something I've been doing. The, more the front page of the Times is home page, not, not. Yeah, the, not the New York Times. Yeah, you find it, it should like a big Twitter feed, like on the <laughs> print edition, right? Uh, but but the, the web is seen as, as leading the print edition now, and they've gotten away from doing things where we're going to hold, there are some exceptions, but we're not going to hold the story um, online until the print edition comes out, it's usually, usually the reverse. Do, right. um, and the third, like I said before, is uh, 
is you know people do have their individual brands within the Times, and that seems to be very important. Where one um, one unfortunate reality I think that I've discovered looking at um, looking at traffic at 5:38 and at um, at based on perspectives is that you know you really do people do follow um, individual writers more than they follow the kind of umbrella of the brand. You can get some synergy. It's not zero, but you have to make sure that your individual contributors are really talented <clears throat> and looked after. Um, and they tend to do a good job of allowing people to have, um, to have voice. Even though you operate with, with a lot of editorial constraints relative to being a blogger on your own, um, to have a strong pro style and to trust their writers to, uh, to get the story right in the end. And to be fair in the end, they, for example, allow their, their writers a lot more leeway on on Twitter than other organizations do. Right. And as a result, they're, they're people tend to be followed a lot more and a lot more worth following on Twitter than, than other news organizations. So they kind of, they get all that stuff, which a lot of places don't, I think. Did you, um, did you read <laughs> Snowfall, the, the Times package mm -hmm. that they put together? Yeah. Uh, and what did you think of that? This was a, a, a package that the Times put together about an avalanche that ran, um, I think, as its own section in the Sunday paper. But uh, what was online was actually much richer. Yeah, than and I think it's pretty pretty amazing. Actually, the the, uh, the person who created that story, I was at the TED conference uh, just yesterday, and she was talking about uh, <clears throat> their process for you testing a lot of things and thinking about the user <clears throat> experience. Where um, does this multimedia content get too much in the way of the narrative of the story? Right. right. Um, so it's not a matter of just kind of you know putting up a bunch of of, uh, of of interactive graphics, there's a, a craft there in thinking about um, how is this conveying information to the reader and how these things actually complement one another instead of just having different static elements that are kind of lumped together on an overly busy page. And that, that's difficult, right? Right. Um, right? But the fact that they are thinking about this user experience in a way um, is, is important. Um, all right, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, and my name's Tom Pounds. I'm here uh, as an alumnus of the Sloan School. Um, Depending on what news outlets we favor, we could all get concerned to one degree or another about either voter fraud or voter suppression. Um, do you think the success of your uh, result in the last election should give us confidence in our voting infrastructure and system? And how much sleep do you lose over that issue? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, I mean, what we talk about what are the what are the social benefits of <laughs> of polling, right? And and yeah, one of them is that. Um, in theory, you're, you're serving what the average, average man or woman on the street thinks. But another one is that it can serve as something of a check um, against massive electoral fraud, potentially. Um, you know, I tend to think that these problems are, are pretty overstated uh, by, by both parties. And maybe um, the fact that the polling does do a pretty good job is, is partly a testament to this. Um, but you have Republicans complain about, for example, illegal immigrants registering to vote, and you know, North Carolina did an audit on this, and you, I think you had eight people, right, out of a state where you have five million voters. So it's non-zero, for instance. Um, you know, they're kind of often democratic conspiracies about what voting machines are doing. Um, you know, I think they're kind of often uh, Democrats are missing the, the low-hanging fruit there, right? Which is that, well, how about people have to stand in line for three hours to in vote, Miami, right? right? Yeah, right. Miami, or even in New York City, right? There's no shadowy conspiracy there, right? It's just a, a tangible fact, right? Or for example, why do we even require people to, um, to register in advance at all? Where in states like Wisconsin or North Dakota, we can register on the same day, turnout's quite a bit higher. Why do you have to go to a physical polling place to vote now? Where I can, from, um, from the comfort of my phone now, transfer $20,000 from, um, from my checking account to my savings account if I want, or unlimited amounts of money, right? But, um, but I have to go to the polling place to actually vote. So I think people uh, sometimes love these conspiratorial stories about how, oh, the vote's been, been suppressed and missed ways that would make it a lot easier for people to vote um, just in very elementary ABC kind of reforms. Well, um, I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, a big thanks to Nate, who arrived. Um, who, who arrived in Boston at 6 this morning after a red-eye flight from California so he could be here. Um, uh, you, were, you were shockingly eloquent, considering the amount of sleep you must have had. I'm, I'm traveling so much now that I get excited. Where tomorrow's March 1st, I think, right? Yeah. So you have new in-flight magazines <laughs> on March 1st. <laughs>
<laughs> um, uh, this, is, uh, this has been a great forum. Thank you all for the questions, and uh, we hope we see you later in the semester.